Good evening, this is Open Book. I'm Richard Wynnum. My guest is Deborah Levine, Editor-in-Chief of the American Diversity Report. Deborah has written 18 books, and according to her biography, she has been a changemaker for a diverse world in challenging times for more than three decades. In fact, truth be told, Deborah has been remaking the world, at least in her imagination, from the time when she was a little girl growing up on the island of Bermuda. I I looked outside my window in the dark to see if I could see the fairies dancing in the garden. You're sure they were there? (laughs) I would scream as we drove through the one tiny little drawbridge in Bermuda because I was sure that the ogres and monsters lived just under the bridge. It was so real to me. In fact, to the point where when the movie theater there finally opened, we went to see a movie, and when the monsters came onto the screen, I screamed bloody murder and wouldn't shut up. And I was banned by my family from going to the movies for the next year and a half. And when we came to America and I saw TV for the first time and I saw Lassie and Lassie somehow got lost and couldn't find her way home, I was miserable and I sobbed and cried and it was just so real to me, you know. It was funny when my daughter uh, was a toddler, maybe like one and a half. I hear the screaming coming from the bathroom. She's on the toilet, and I run in, and she's looking at the towel in front of her, and it has all the baby ducks. It doesn't have the mommy duck. And she was screaming that they were lost, and they couldn't find the mommy duck. And I thought, oh, my Lord, clone. It, it somehow may the world come alive in a different way. But it also teaches you things about how to get along with people, how to manage monsters. It's what the Victorian English people did with stories like Tom the Water Baby, when Tom, who was a chimney sweep, falls into the ocean and the mermaids adopt him and he becomes a mermaid. It was one of my favorite stories ever. I, I used that for my memoir. It was originally called Deborah the Water Baby. <laughs> 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 but because Americans and maybe many British these days don't know what that means, I had to change it. There's a huge difference between English writing and American writing in yeah. so many ways, right? But it, that whimsicality that's especially in children's books, you don't see that in American books. You know, it's a different way of introducing children to the world. It is. It is, and it's something that of, of the three of us, my two brothers and I, I was most passionate about uh, to the point where I taught myself, or I was taught, learned to read at age three or four so I could go through the books. just had to. Even as a little girl, I would sit at my grandparents' dock, look over the horizon, and imagine going off into space, going off into other worlds. And there was a book, I think it was by an Australian author for children, about how the kids would climb up this magic tree and it would twirl around and drop them off in a different world. And they could experience all kinds of strange things. I loved it. And, of course, that's why my second memoir is called The Magic Marble. Some things you just never forget. Well, it also strikes me that uh, somebody living on an island is always going to be wondering what's over the horizon. Perhaps, but I know a lot of my my friends, not so much. Mm-hmm. We had lovely lives there, but you know, my 
my parents had both gone to Ivy League colleges in, in the States. And there was a sense of another world out there always. And it was a mystery at the time until we moved to the States. And it wasn't so much a mystery as a disappointment, actually. Where were the fairies and, and the goblins and the elves? Nowhere. It was incredible asphalt roads and cement jungles. I hated every minute of it until my parents decided they had to find a way for me to adapt. And they did. They took me to art galleries, mm. art museums, natural history museum in New York. They, they took me um, to off-Broadway plays and music and ballet. I think the day my mom took me to Madison Square Garden to see the Russian Moiseyev ballet perform. Okay, I like this place after all. <laughs> the, the internationalism, the different beautiful artwork was something that you couldn't quite get in Bermuda, at least not then. And it was, it's, it's the arts that do it for me, always. But that whimsical flavor that you talked about, hey, it's, it's still in me, and I have a sense that I'm actually going to write another book <laughs> about the arts and whimsy and how... All of that has shaped me into what I do in diversity and everything else. It's coming. I started the notes. Uh, the book that you gave me reminded me of teaching freshmen how to write. <laughs> yes. So... Elmore Leonard, I love Elmore Leonard's writing, uh, mostly as it's um, translated into films. To be honest, I don't, I haven't actually, I'm not sure I've actually read one of his books, <laughs> but I've seen several of his films, and he seems to have in common, in to my ear, with Quentin Tarantino and with Guy Ritchie, that ability to write this most exotic language. That sounds like everyday speech, but it's everyday speech in this kind of, uh, I don't know, hyper stylized universe. Um, and Elmore Leonard, you quoted as saying, if it sounds like writing, I rewrite it. Or if proper usage gets in the way, it may have to go. One scene that always sticks in my mind is John Travolta. And I forget the black actor's name, but they're talking about, uh, I think it was John Travolta who'd spent time in France. And he was asking him if they serve McDonald's in France and what it's called. <laughs> and they go into this whole disquisition of, uh, you know, the French terms for the American uh, descriptions for the hamburger, you know, and the, and the ingredients. Uh Guy Ritchie, in some way, even more, has this way of, of writing what a, sounds like blue-collar London English, but it's a kind of idealized version of it, where, <laughs> where it's writerly, but at the same time um, transparent, just... So easy to understand exactly what he means, even though the way he's saying it's mostly men, even though the even while the way he's saying it sounds almost like a uh, Shakespearean soliloquy, you know. Yeah. You know, I, I imagine you and I grew up similarly, trying to speak a much more aristocratic version of English. Mm -hmm. So when I came to America at age seven. And they say, the Jesuits anyway, say that by the age of seven, 
you're pretty much indoctrinated, mm. right? Uh, I spoke a very aristocratic kind of British English, and I got beaten up on the playground because of it. Americans did, felt it was so pompous that as kids, there was no tolerance. How did I survive? Because I, I couldn't, I really couldn't change how I spoke. So I survived by learning how to swear and <laughs> using <laughs> words that I could never repeat at home on the recess playground. And for that, I was accepted. <laughs> when I think about it, though, it, it, it was actually pretty ingenious for a kid, little kid, yeah, to uh, to figure out how to work around this. But I will say that we were in elementary school and we were going to do a play. Uh, and uh, it called for the opening person to be a sort of herald to the court and do the hear ye, hear ye thing. And I'm sitting there and the ki- the teacher says, Levine, that's you. And I say, why me? And he said, because you could do this in your sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I didn't even think about it. Big deal. But apparently it was a good fit. Still is. Because I have to often write in a sort of British English style, even these days, and then translate. Because American English, it simplifies verbs, right? It doesn't use the same kinds of tenses. It's much more direct. It, it doesn't uh, enjoy nuances. <laughs> so I have to translate for a different audience. And that has actually helped my style by recognizing it. Now, back in the day when I was in in, uh, high school, I resented having to do this. And we had an assignment that said, uh, if you had only 30 days to live, what would you do? So I wrote that I would go back to Bermuda, I would sit by the ocean, I would just watch the waves come in and be grateful that I didn't have to be in this stupid English class with this stupid English teacher listening to this crap. <laughs> right? So I get the paper back, and it's an A+. Plus. Cool. And then the teacher says, we are now going to have one of you read out loud your paper. Like, okay. And he looks at me, you. And I'm like, I just stare, terrified. And he says, if I can take it, you can take (laughs) it. (laughs) And so I did. (laughs) I didn't know at the time that this gentleman's mom was a famous Broadway play writer and that he was enjoying the heck out of this. (laughs) The kids I grew up around... Uh, we we lived on a uh, on a council estate, apartment buildings, um, a project basically, um, a uniquely English project. Had lots of uh, green fields all around it, or green hills, but most of the kids that I hung out with were definitely anti intellectuals. They were not people who were going to be going to grammar school and on to university. That just wasn't in their future, probably, you know. So I'd I'd learned to sort of live in two worlds. What I wrote on the page and what I said were two totally different things. Mm, Good for you. I learned, you know, watcher when you you (laughs) meet somebody. Watcher, oh, yeah, watcher. What does that mean? (laughs) Um, and you know that sort of thing, which it, it, you, it would be difficult to even transliterate it and put it on the page. What ex- how do you spell that? You know, um, and you know, I read the Beano and Dandy and other comics like that. You know, and, you know got the language from that. You know, 
No, I, I could relate to everything you were saying um, in 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 uh, your book, and I, I love some of the things you said. I thought they were great. You know, uh, make your story personal, use the first person. I mean, dear reader, you know, the, the, the first novelist that's what they did, right? They wrote them almost like almost like a letter. Yeah, you know? yeah. And they were didactic to some degree, as you were saying. They were. Do you think that was deliberate on the part of a writer like Jane Austen, that she was trying to inculcate a, a mode of expression? Oh, absolutely. I think that when you, when you look at some of the most famous stories historically, okay, the ones with the most impact, right, they're written from the first person's point of view. Uh, that's what makes them last centuries, <laughs> you know, in their um, personalities and eventually maybe become a movie. Uh, the, I may have shared with you that um, when I became a freshman at college, um, I, didn't, I didn't see a major that I wanted uh, and uh, the dean said, well, you will major in English or economics like everyone else. I did not. You know me well, don't you? So what happened is that was the first year they offered a major in folklore and mythology. Mm. And I signed up like that, and off we went. And what I discovered in in studying that was there were trends in stories, uh, oral uh, history and fables and legends and um, all of these different genres within the folklore and mythology world, you know, had a history of their own. Uh, but each one of them had some interesting drama that would capture people's imagination. So even the simplest of Aesop's fables, right? The tortoise and the hare, right? People know it even now, right? And why? That was what we were looking at. What is it that makes something so memorable for centuries? And that's what I studied, and I was really happy to do so. It was an amazing experience um, to hear from some of the people who created that major back in the day. Uh, Albert Lord, that was his name, Professor Lord. And it was... Um, highly intellectual, okay, about an issue, stories, you know, that really doesn't need to be intellectual, but to think about it, quite frankly, as a science as well as an art was what happened, and it shaped me forever. Um, it was uh, one of the best decisions I ever made. <laughs> I, th I think it allows you to move beyond copying and understand to sort of in internalize the mode without having to repeat it you can you can put your own voice yeah through that template and that's so very true in what i've done of course and what i teach others to do i think i mentioned to you that just maybe a week or two ago i did a session here at UTC, on storytelling uh, and, and what makes it come alive and memorable. Um, it was, it always is, a great fun to teach, to get the questions, and then to see the students send me their stories. And they, they're, they're in communications, and they also look at diversity, and the stories are just phenomenal. In fact, I put out a special issue of the American Diversity Report with just their stories. 
I hadn't really considered it until we started talking, but I think maybe Charles Dickens was a huge influence on Guy Ritchie <laughs> because he does essentially the same thing. Um, and to your point in your book, um, and for that matter, what you were talking about with folklore, he creates these indelible characters. Yes, he does. And one of the things that makes them indelible is their mode of speech. Yes, the mode of speech, the, the cultural expressions that we use, as well as the grammar and the, the sentences, whatever, you know, are uh, something that really resonates with people. If you choose them wisely, if you don't, you're going to really make a mess. So the, mm -hmm. the, the issue of the cultural expressions, the metaphors and similes, right, really needs to be addressed. And what are you going to do with that? How are you going to build your story around them so that people see through your eyes? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they have to be, at one and the same time, immediately identifiable and yet novel. There's something about them that you haven't seen before, that you haven't heard before. That right, or the context of them. Tickles your curiosity. Yeah. You know, what does she mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think about this as an opening sentence? Okay. This is a, a book by a, a Japanese author called... Sayu Ishida, I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it, but that's what it looks like. Uh, the book is called Will Prescribe You a Cat. The first sentence is, Shuta Kagawa stood at the end of a shadowy alley, gazing up at a multi-purpose building. My first reaction is um, using a vague description a multi-purpose building, does not engage people. Right? The vaguer you are, the faster they're going to run off. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that, that's something that you want to keep in mind. Um, that might make a decent first draft. <laughs> uh, in, in fairness to the author, it, it's, it's in translation. Um, okay, that could be... And, and since I can't read, Jap read the Japanese, <laughs> I have no idea if, if, if that's what he said or what he originally wrote. Right. Um, what I liked about it was that he's, he tells you everything without telling you anything. That well, there's, that's he, there's a man on the street. He's looking up at a building. Why is, he at that, why is he at that point? Why is he looking at that building? What's he doing there? What's, it, what's his... You know, in that sense, it um, plays to one of your um, instructions on how to write effectively, which, to be honest, one of the things that you wrote that, I thought, wow, how do you do that? You said, write the first sentence and write the last sentence. Yeah. Well, how do you know what the last sentence is until you've written the first one and the second one and the third one? <laughs> One of the reasons why I tell people to write the first sentence of each chapter and then in the, in the last sentence or, or even the first paragraph and the last paragraph is because so many people get stuck and never get to the last paragraph, right? But I, I want, I'm forcing them, basically, right, to think through where they begin and where that story ends before the next story chapter comes up. And to do that, you have to think through, well, what do I want to say? Mm -hmm. right? You don't have to write it down. It doesn't have to be perfect. And you can go back and amend. But the idea that you could, could bring the story together like that, rather than ramble around from chapter to chapter, paragraph to paragraph, right, is key. And one of the things that I, I tell people in my workshops, right, mm -hmm. is um, 
let's just give a minimum amount of chapters to your book. Say seven. Okay? Write down seven words or phrases that you think will show up in your book somewhere. Okay? And I give you two minutes, and that's it. Right? Well, by giving people a short amount of time, they can't just meander about. They've got to write down something, right? And they do. And the interesting thing is they can use those seven words as the beginning of each of the chapters because they really know what they want to say. They just don't know that they know they want to say <laughs> what they want to say. And, and so when you give people... A time constraint, right? something happens. Too many people who, who say, oh, I've always wanted to write, write a book or maybe an essay, or that, but I just can't get started. Um, this is for them because it gets them started. And if you want to go then to the end before the next chapter, well, you've already got the chapters lined up, so you're halfway there. And that's the beauty of it. How do you get to do something you've always wanted to, but doubt you can do it, put it off, put it off some more, and give up? And, of course, there's that great old saying, you can't edit a blank page. So uh, you studied writing, and that is uh, grammar, yes. uh, syntax, all that. Then you s studied mythology and folk tales. Yes, indeed. The combination of those two. Did that help you as a writer? It did, and there was a third element too, and that is um, folklore and mythology was uh, an honors major, and you were required to have a sub-major, as it were. And I chose cultural anthropology. And the combination right, of writing folklore and mythology and cultural anthropology it was just amazing, dynamite. And that's what I've used in all my work. And it allows me to travel to other worlds, open windows to those worlds through the writing, right, with the stories. It, it's been such a gift. And the older I get, the more I use it, the more I want to use it. Who knows what I'll do next? This is Open Book. My guest Deborah Levine's most recent book, When Hate Groups March Down Main Street, Engaging a Community Response, draws on her decades of work with communities and organizations, developing an understanding of and finding ways of counteracting hate groups. Beginning with her father, who was a U.S. intelligence officer in World War II, assigned to interrogate Nazi prisoners of war, her family has been dedicated tikkun olam, which is a Hebrew expression meaning for repair of the world. Deborah wrote about her father, including his wartime letters in her memoir, The Liberator's Daughter. Her website is americandiversityreport.com. For the second half of the program, my guest is Amy Wright. Dr. Wright is a professor of English at Austin P. University in Clarksville, Tennessee. Like my other guests this evening, Deborah Levine, Amy Wright uses the study of language and communication 
to foster better understanding. Her most recent book, Paper Concert, is a distillation of more than a decade of conversations with a range of writers and thinkers, including Coleman Barks, Dorothy Allison, Dinty Moore, Ray Armentrout. She asked every one of the people she talked to the same questions, beginning with, when in your life have you felt freest? But her central question was, who am I? You said in the beginning of the book that your abiding question was, who am I? Yeah. It sort of assumes um, when you interview somebody that they know the answer to that question. <laughs> right. Right. But I think a lot of the time in the process of being interviewed, they come to discover that maybe they um, recognize things that they didn't necessarily, um, well, they weren't, I don't know how to put that exactly. It's not so much, I think, that they weren't aware of it. It's just that they haven't really given any thought until mm. it's brought out in that kind of interview situation with the questions you ask, you know. So do you shape the questions to... Uh, fit the person to whom you're talking or do you because I don't th as an example um, when have you felt freest seem to be one of your favorite questions and you ask that of almost everybody mm -hmm. was that in your mind uh, a particularly illuminating question I got a lot of really fascinating answers to that question, and it continues to be interesting to me as a question. And I, I think a lot of times there's a certain energy that arises in a conversational dynamic that can help you access answers to questions that you've posed to yourself in the same way that we, we kind of formulate different personas in relationship. I think we can find our way to different answers in the context of different conversational dynamics. And so it was partly a response to, or it was partly a question directed to individuals, but it was also a question that I kept hearing differently um, in resonance with my own answers. And so that's why some questions continued to be interesting um, across, well, years. And, and some of the questions were really highly individual. I mean, thinking about class and talking to Dorothy Allison, I mean, it just makes sense that that question is going to be more illuminating in particular conversation with her. Um, you can't just, it, it, it's not a, as alive. The question is not going to be alive in every conversational dynamic. Uh, one of your questions uh, to, Do to Dorothy Allison brought out a very unsettling a memory for her mm. as children living with her stepfather. Yes. I mean, sometimes, and we, all of the conversations had took place in different environments. That one took place in the sunroom of my house after I had made her dinner. So we had much more access to intimacy and trust. And, and she also spent um, several weeks with us as part of an ACUF chair of excellence that I was able to in invite her to participate in on our campus. And so uh, a certain amount of trust can develop over time and you can access different areas. But I did try to create that dynamic as quickly as possible in all of the conversations that I had by first offering access to myself and um, establishing a certain amount of rapport with the people that I was talking to and also giving them always permission to edit the interview. I I know people have different relationships to that final process, but I did always give um, the interviewee permission to at least review the conversation before it published. When you start asking questions as you did of uh, Dorothy Allison though about Class, mm. I think the first the first question I'd have about that is, what does that mean? It's, you know, America is so uh, celebrated for being a classless society, which I think any of us who've lived here for very long know isn't true. Mm -hmm. But what exactly does class mean, and how do we 
as individuals identify that and i guess we, which is anyway we can really answer that question so i'll answer it uh i don't really know to be honest mm -hmm. um yeah. I, uh, I i grew up on what what you call a project here the it's government housing my mother came from a middle class family my father came from his his dad was a, a very wealthy architect in london how do you think of yourself that way i fall i think by any standard measurement i would fall pretty within well within the middle class and i thought of myself as a young person as middle class but that was you know, like the long 18th century or something. I mean, it was sort of very flexible. Um, the middle class, and I think it was more about defining myself within the middle, because as soon as you find out that you're part of this vast um, middle class that seemed to encompass pretty much everyone in my peer group, because once it started becoming harder to tell, once clothes could mask it it's really just mannerisms it's very subtle and kids kids are very subtle and, and pick up on body language um and there are certainly ways that we identify but i think you start i probably felt like i was always kind of parsing a, a, an entire spectrum of a middle class. Um, it was only when I got older that I started distinguishing a kind of working class and and now it seems to be just an out of touch luxury class with you know the one percent, um, which I talked to Dorothy Allison about in the book. But to me, it always was very slippery because my grandparents, just within one generation, um, if if we were of different classes, it would have been hard to imagine, but I had farmers on one side and a carpenter preacher on the other side. We had homemakers on both sides, and it was almost impossible to distinguish that from my parents who worked together at an insurance agency um, and, and farmed in the evenings, kind of moonlighting as farmers. And so the professions were very similar. The work ethic was very similar. And so I wouldn't have distinguished my grandparents' class as different. But when I looked back on it later um, in time, I was like, well, they they would probably have been uh, considered working class and we would have been considered um, something different. But of course, you never think of that as a, as a kid. Um, and I was talking to Dorothy in large part, um, wanting to probe that area because it's such a, a, a font of inspiration for her and a, a point of, of pride and a commonality. And, and I felt like I, I really resonated on that same level. Um, and, and she gave me a lot of clarity on it. She, she really helped me to, to see the distinctions. And, um, but, but even within that, I shared, I shared some, some things like, I, I felt like I had left my family behind. I'm, I'm quoting using air quotes for that because um, she talks about that feeling like when she went away to school, she was leaving her family behind and she had to go back and reckon with getting an education and how having an education can alienate you from parents who didn't have as much education. And I reckoned with that. Um, my parents had an associate's degree and I, so I wasn't a first generation college student in a traditional sense, um, but there was definitely a mark. And as I went further to get my education than they had gone, that was another kind of distinction. Um, you know, we, I went to a college and we had a different accent than we had in the South. And so that was a marker um, and a distinction. So I felt like I, Different levels of class reckon with similar issues about belonging and isolation and what it means to be part of something and um, excluded or to have access or not have access to certain resources. Um, so I felt like I, I resonated with her more deeply than perhaps class might indicate. Education definitely complicates things. Um, the higher ed especially but i think even uh where you go to grade school did you go to a private school or did you go to a public school this sort of thing right 
but people who have not been through a college education tend to think people who have are exalted in some way, don't you think? I think there can be a certain defensiveness about anything that we haven't experienced or or don't understand completely. And so it probably arises from fear um, and maybe not you know, not having access to it and feeling defensive about not having that level of access or um, not knowing what it means exactly, but feeling defensive about not being able to, um, to know and to know what that means. But yeah, I'm, I'm still even, I have a pretty big family and I would have to go pretty far out to find another PhD. It's just, there, I think, you know, a, a cousin through marriage, um, you know, he he's in admissions or something at Duke, but there's, you know, it's, it's several branches out from my immediate family. Um, and so I understand, I do understand how that's, it's not common. And I glimpsed through my mentors and professors that other way of looking at the university and having um, maybe the prestige of a life of the mind. And I was probably drawn to that as a young person because I hadn't really seen or had access to that except what I imagined in books. And so you you think of this um, maybe a, a position of privilege or something because it is luxurious to to be able to spend one's time contemplating um, ideas and and writing about um, matters that aren't of immediate import, but um, it's it's also I I work at a teaching institution, and so I I don't have the um, it's it's a good compromise and and a um, a very practical application of my education that I've gotten to, and, and probably I'm most comfortable with that, maybe because of my upbringing and and that sensitivity that I have to um, PhDs, doctorates being, um, privileged or of a, a different class than, you know, the middle class. I think maybe it comes down to worlds and academe. Uh, it sometimes comes home to me it is, is a world. I, I sometimes realize I live in this little bubble. Mm. And I talked to to my friends who are not in academia, and I realized that I, I look at the world with all kinds of assumptions that they don't, mm -hmm. because they don't think the same way I do. Mm -hmm. And part of it is, as you said, we have this uh, astonishing liberty to think about things. What do you think about that for? Get on and do what you're supposed to be doing. Nobody ever says that. They say mm -hmm. just the opposite. Oh, mm -hmm. what are you thinking about? Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the students uh, with whom you interact uh, the same way. So in that sense, it, it, um, academe is kind of a, a class to itself. But that whole notion that you were talking about before about access, and I, th and I thought that was one of the most telling things that Dorothy Allison said, that when she visits these universities, she talks to the children who are from working class backgrounds and warns them yeah. to be careful about how much they try to gain access to this to this world mm -hmm. that is uh, well it, it, it's on the one hand it's it, it's inherently middle class the notion that that you, that you can work at something that, that in in the traditional sense cannot be possibly be described as labor and it doesn't necessarily generate an immediate fiscal res uh, return so it's a uh, it's an exalted position in the culture in many ways you know so you you don't have a chauffeur but at the same time you you uh, you have that kind of situation where other people are working so that you can continue to do what you do you think that's true well, I, 
Because I teach writing and because I train students in classes about the professionalization of writing and editing, um, and because I write nonfiction in particular, which is informational or it can be educational, um, I have a slightly different relationship to that dynamic of it being entirely removed. Um, I, I'm, it's always important to me to apply what we learn and know. And I, I get to do that a lot of, of times in my, in my work. And so we're a lot closer in some of my classes to the vocations and to the um, what's next after this class. And we do a lot of talking about how this particular skill applies in the quote unquote real world. Um, and so it doesn't, uh, even our conversations, which might venture into the realm of the personal and into um, sort of life lessons, we also keep bringing them back to a consideration of the larger social structures and how that learning, that knowledge, that insight is relevant um, to a particular context and to a particular time. So sometimes you have to build those bridges and help people to understand that while we are lucky to be able to spend 55 minutes or so um, talking about some passage in a text and what it means or stands for or how it was constructed, um, we also take that conversation into, uh, you know, in our, into our own writing, into our editing skills, um, and into a consideration of audience to think about why that's important, why it's relevant, how it can be made more relevant, because of course there are writers that aren't considering the larger social construct or, or the implications of certain uses of phrases. Um, and gosh, hasn't it changed so much just in the last five years, let alone the last decade, um, you know, considerations of just an accidental use of, of, a, of a certain word might be really insensitive in ways that we haven't been aware of before. And so there's, there's responsibility in the classroom that's, um, that's very direct and I, I don't, I, maybe I'm part of a sort of generational shift or, or something in the classroom, but I do think that I had more access to um, a life of the room, a, a life of the mind as removed from life as it is, um, or at least an illusion of that for a time. And I wouldn't trade it at all now. Um, it's really important to me that the life of the mind is fully integrated with life as it is. But I do think that sometimes um, people can't see the connections between them and people can't see the relevance of both of them to each other. I think that maybe um, what your book is doing and what uh, writers and probably musicians and other creatives are trying to do is to try to give us some kind of uh, understanding of who we are and why we do what we do mm -hmm. and the world in which we live, which I think from that point of view, if we can better understand so many people um, at the moment keep talking about how unsettled the world is mm. and what a seriously frightening place it's becoming and i don't know if, if it helps at all to understand why these things happen but if we're answering any questions at all i think that's the question we're trying to answer and at the same time it struck me that your recurring question when did you feel the freest could also be phrased as when did you stop feeling afraid ah, mm. a person who's not afraid is truly free aren't they mm -hmm. so in that sense we're, we're offering people the opportunity to to be free of at least the existential fear of a world that seems to be going mad mm. <laughs> well and and if we can 
talk to each other and open up more lines of communication, I think we'll find that some of our fears are unjustified. Some of our fears are based on false beliefs that can be unwound just by a simple conversation with someone on the other side of some point of view. Um, and I think if we Perhaps it's a little idealistic, but I do think that when we open up, and maybe that's the real advantage of an, a higher education is that you have more access to people across disciplines, across other sides of um, you know, the, the campus, so to speak. And so you've got more perspectives available to you. And with those perspectives comes a broader mind. And you know, if if you gain that, how could you not feel obligated to share it and to and to help communicate that with others? And then you come to put together a book uh, like your book, and that's essentially a distillation of all those conversations. You have created a kind of uh, literary quilt. Thank you for saying that. Qu quilt does feel apropos, and I... I do, um, I feel like I represent my heritage in sometimes hidden ways, um, but I, I, it was a patchwork to put together these different conversations. And so I'm glad that you see it that way. And I also do hope that it um, does some of the work. It, it felt like a responsibility. Um, so I, I hope it, it manifests as that. Well, it's, 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 it's a wonderful opportunity to be, to be able to, you, know, you could um, bring all of the people um, represented in your book into one room together and sit down, and it wouldn't be the same as talking to them individually and then distilling what they had to say the way you have. It makes it, uh, in some ways, I think, uh, an opportunity to commune with them and to uh, uh, dive deeper into those ideas than you might be able to otherwise, you know, with that many people in the room. Even though they might express the same thoughts, it, 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 it sort of reduces the cacophony a little bit. Well, th thank you for picking up on that. It's definitely something that's always bothered me about group dynamics. Here you have all these interesting people with this wealth of information and experience um, and inevitably the conversations in groups tend to devolve to the most basic small talk they stay on just the surface of things because you can't possibly keep accessing diving deep into you know conversations it really requires a one-on-one -on -one dynamic for you to really go to the deeper territories. And so that is the advantage that could only happen in the form of a book. And a, a written text can create um, levels of depth across um, different people, across different conversations and subjects and times um, that, you know, it's, it's a kind of magical world that can be constructed on the page that can't really exist in the world because everyone's just going to talk about something that came up in the news or or the weather. I, I agree. I uh, have uh, worked at the university for more than half my life, and I worked at a public radio station for the same amount of time. And putting the two together is an interesting combination. Like you, I've had access to people I would never otherwise have been able to have the kind of conversation I had with them. And the other thing that I love about it, and, and I realized really quickly, is that if you have the temerity to ask, people will answer almost any question you ask, which, uh, if it were, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one situation, in any other situation, you're a rather nosy person, aren't you? But in that, they don't say that. They, um, I'm not sure exactly why that is, but it, it does seem, um, you know, what you were talking about before, that the people are willing to open and I think at least in part, again, as you said, because they see that you're going to willing to do the same thing. So even though you're asking somebody to come into a public forum and talk about something very personal, if you do the same thing yourself, somehow it feels more comfortable. I, I have found that to be true on 95% of the, um, 95% of the cases or something, but occasionally you do, you know, and I, I, I address that in one of the chapters in the book where, you know, you, you overstep that bound where you assume too much, um, empathy, compassion, understanding. Um, I, I really have been 
educated by that process too, because my, I just have a metaphorical brain and I make connections really easily. And I have it. Part of my personality is to find commonalities and, and it's, it's easy to find common ground for me. Um, it's not as easy to um, be aware of the subtleties of what makes us different. Uh, you know, I have to there's less payoff for that um, in finding the differences and distinguishing those differences. Although I've certainly been made more aware of the value of it as a process of having conversations with people whose life experiences are very different from mine. Um, and that's part of the curiosity, but it's also part of the limits. Um, and you, it's important to respect those limits and interviewing has taught me that too. I agree. I think I, at some point I realized that Interviewing is not about asking questions, but about listening and mm. trying to be trying to be empathetic while at the same time uh, allowing my natural curiosity to take me places which, as you say, uh, sometimes takes places that people aren't necessarily comfortable with and they're, they're uh, not shy about saying, and shouldn't be, that, no, I don't really want to talk about that. That's... And and it, it's kind of uh, it's it's kind of uh, an aha moment. Like, oh my, you're right. I I, I just uh, I got caught up in this whole process and and you know realized that um, I have to be sensitive in this process, which makes it that much more complicated. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when somebody is good at it, as you are, it can uh, be very rewarding for people reading or listening as it is for us to engage in it. Well, I would certainly compliment you on your listening skills because I definitely feel that energy and that openness and receptivity. And there's a, there's a real patience, um, not only with yourself. I think first, if you give that grace to yourself to fully articulate your, your thoughts and ideas, it gives your conversational partner that kind of permission and we're so often impatient with each other and maybe we're processing our own answers and not fully listening um but i really feel that energy um in your conversation you make a space for patience and um really thinking kind of out loud together collaborating in that process that generates true and fresh and original thought amy wright's most recent book Paper Concert is an exhilarating and provocative collage of answers to a range of thought-provoking questions from over a decade of conversations with a wide range of writers and thinkers. This is Open Book. I'm Richard Winham. Thanks for listening. Please join me again next month. You can also find these conversations on the radio station website. Good night. <laughs>